Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop. Today is April 27th, 2023, and we're talking to Kara Federmeyer, who is professor in the Department of Psychology, Program in Neuroscience in the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology at the University of Illinois. Kara studies the neurobiological basis of meaning, especially, but not exclusively, meaning in language. And she uses human electrophysiological measurements, behavior, eye movements, brain imaging methods to try to understand how the brain extracts meaning out of sensory information. Hi, Kara. Hi. Thanks for having me. Welcome. And with us is also Nicole Pucha, our own language expert. Hi, Nicole. Hi. And Antonio Alivato, a PhD student in the department working in Nicole's lab. Hi, Antonio. Hey, Dr. Wilson. <laughs> so this is not Kara's first podcast. Um, if you are interested in the topic we're going to be talking about, I recommend her previous podcast, episode 67, April 14th, 2011, 12 years ago, almost. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And uh, today we'll revisit maybe some of the topics at that time, but with that update, with some things that have been filled in, and um, I'm not really positive exactly where we'll go. Uh, but one of the things that's happened since then is the development of large language models. And they're very closely related, I think, because the best way for us to make machines that do language would be if the machines did it the way we think we do it. And, uh, and if it isn't like that, then that would be interesting too. Right. So uh, these models perform some of the same tasks human do, humans do, both in language comprehension and production. And probably everybody's had a chance to fool around with them some, and they're remarkable. So I will care. I wonder if you could help us sort of understand what are the tasks that a human or a large language model has to do, and so that we could understand what the language model does and whether it relates to what we really do or not. Right. Well, fundamentally, right, the large language models are taking words as they come in and trying to use them to put together a larger um, meaning of some kind, and in many cases then to maybe make a prediction about what comes next or it, to actually produce, you know, what comes next. And so, so that's part of what's similar about these models. And, um, you know, these models have gotten good in part because they, um, they they are remarkable. They're able to do sort of not only figure out how, what what how, well, how words go together. So what's really interesting when you kind of go under the hood of these models is that they don't really know anything about meaning. Right. All they're learning is st statistics over words. They know that if I've gotten these eight words, that these other words are, but nowhere in there, right? Those models have no experience of the world. They don't, they've never had a sensory apprehension of a table or a chair. So when they know that table goes with chair, it's all just being done by language statistics, which in that sense is very different, we think, from what humans are doing. So, you know, isn't that a little bit like, um, when you talk about word probability and in four hundred, right? Then that's really analogous, isn't it? To just saying whether this is the right mix. right. But so what's interesting is that you know I think we think when we're communicating with one another with language that we are tapping into knowledge structures in one another that are not just linguistics li 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 uh, linguistic in nature, right? We think that when I say table, Nicole is thinking about sensory features of tables or could be thinking about sensory features of tables. These models can't do that and yet they can do a really good job in some cases of modeling human behavior and human neural signals even. And so, I don't know, maybe we need to reconsider whether our comprehension of language is as grounded, if you will, as we thought it was. Maybe when we're talking about tables and chairs, we don't really go back in and grab a lot of those sensory features. But that's an interesting question of whether um, are we just processing statistics of language or to what extent are we when we're um, uh, imagining what comes next, um, and or how much is what we're doing actually built on other kinds of 
experiences that we have in the world. So I would, it makes, what Charlie's ask, uh, asking makes me think about um, what uh, one of my PhD students, Tara uh, Flora, was trying to do with her dissertation that she mentioned it to you. So using something like GPT, ChatGPT, to produce language, right? So right. one of the things that we do as language scientists is we have to come up with stimuli, come up with sentences um, that are designed in a certain way so that we can see how people process them, right? So it takes a long time for us to come up for us to come up with these <laughs> uh, stimuli. So one idea is like, there's this cr incredible tool, the GPT you can get that to produce uh, language for you. And I just was gonna tap into like you mentioned what GPT produced was not necessarily what people what, what produced. What people then produced, right? Yeah. I mean, it produces things that are sensible, um, but it doesn't always produce the thing that humans would find most predictable in those contexts. Um, in part because, I mean, there's also various processing factors that apply to humans that don't apply to language. So humans are much more likely to come up with a shorter, uh, high frequency word as the ending of a sentence, whereas um, the language models are more likely to pick what might seem like a fancier word that's whose meaning properties are probably more precisely correct for that sentence. But humans, you know, are just going to go to the shorter, simpler word and GPT doesn't need to because it's not under time pressure, it's not under memory pressure, right? So there's, there's, there are some interesting differences. So in the typical experiment that you'd ask a human to do, where they're, um, I guess they're reading a sentence and the words come up one at a time and they have some expectation of a class of, a, a, you know, a list of possible words that would be appropriate as the next word. And then you give them one that is in that list or mm -hmm. one that's wildly out of that list and then study what the mm -hmm. brain does. And the brain seems to immediately recognize whether that word was in the list of likely ones or in the list of unlikely ones. Mm -hmm. And that happens in real time. You can actually right. see it in right. your like physiological recording right. and over the course of a half a second. Yeah, exactly. And and so the um, I guess I'm I'm sort of wondering in, on that time scale, in that kind of thing, where the language models do a pretty good job of that too. Do we really need to know the meaning of the word? Right. Well, and it's and it's very clear that um, humans don't always fully figure out the meanings of things. Um, so there, particularly if we go into the more grammatical domain, and this is not my particular area of work, but um, you know, people will make uh, mistakes. So, th so there's a sort of theory of language processing called good enough processing that says you think you understand what it means, and as long as you think you understand what it means, you don't really have to know what it means. So one common example of this is. Um, a sentence, um, something like, while Anna dressed, the baby splashed in the water. And people will, there's, this is what's known as sometimes a garden path sentence. So when people are first hearing, while Anna dressed, the baby, they often think the baby is what Anna is dressing. But as the sentence progresses, you should be able to figure out that the baby is taking a bath and Anna is dressing herself. And what you find is it's kind of interesting. You can ask people, what was the baby doing? And they know that the baby splashed in the water. And you can ask, did Anna dress herself? And people say yes. But if you say, did Anna dress the baby, people also still say yes. Um, so though, even though they have in some ways updated to say they know the baby was in the bath, they also still misremember the, you know, the first part. So they don't really have a, like that's, you can't have both of those meanings from that sentence. You have to kind of choose which it is. And they don't choose. Um, and so it's true. I, I think people don't always go all the way to like deep meaning um, or even deep, um, you know, full structure when they process language. But maybe the piece the, of the, the groundedness in the world, you know, one of the big differences with the language models is just the sheer amount of data that they are trained on. Um, it would not be realistic for humans to even experience that much data. So humans are clearly learning what the models learn from a much more limited set of input. They just don't get as many exposures to these words and these sentences. And so maybe um, the model has to learn about relationships from about tables and chairs by just getting lots and lots and lots and lots of sentences that have tables and chairs. But maybe humans can bootstrap from real world experience to not need as much language input to get to the same point. So that would give you that would 
make the argument that meaning has value. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> right? Or that, that, yeah, that, that links between, you know, real actual world experience and language has value. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so are you asking, like, if you can pick out these statistical patterns in language, like, what is what are people predicting? Are they just predicting those statistical probabilities, or are they predicting the meaning, predicting yes. the, yeah, so right. that's an interesting way of putting it. But I feel like your research gets to the core of that by looking at these uh, gradations of what's acceptable right. in terms of meaning. Yes, and right, not, not, not necessarily in, in terms, terms of, of the specific word, uh -huh. but also in terms of yeah, yeah, meaning, meaning features. Meaning and features, like yes. and so you might put in a word that would never appear in that context, but it's related to what you were expecting. And you do get, <clears throat> you can see the brain knows that, exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. So at some level, maybe it's getting it. Right. Uh -huh. Something more meaningful. Right, right. And, well, there's a, you know, there's a really old philosophical sort of problem um, about what it means to know a language, right? So um, it asks, you know, imagine a person is shut in a room, they have no experience with the world, and you basically hand them cards in some language that they don't speak. This is often called the Chinese room problem. So you're assuming this person doesn't speak Chinese, and you, but you give them sequences in Chinese, and eventually they can perfectly learn to hand you sequences back in Chinese, but they have never associated any of those, you know, those words, if you will, with anything in the world? Do they know Chinese or do they not know Chinese? And that's where we're at with these large language models. Like, do these models know the language? Well, yes, in the sense that they can put the words together, but no in the sense that, well, maybe no in the sense that they have no idea what a table is, right? You couldn't show that model a picture of a table and have it do anything meaningful with that. So, I think, I'm assuming they have these uh, large language models in other languages. Yeah, but I'm not. I think not as fully formed, but yeah. But I wonder. I'm wondering if uh, if the algorithm is totally different for languages that don't have fixed word order. Mm. Like now, the words can appear in different orders, uh, even if they appear together. And so right. that maybe the the algorithm would have to be different, right? It's not. You can't predict what word is coming next because the the order could change as you're going through the sentence. Like if you're, yeah. Although even in those languages that don't have as strict orders as English, there's still a lot of probabilistic, right? So they it should still be able to learn those probabilities. I'm just thinking of like in okay, so in Spanish I can say the same thing in three different ways, right? Using exactly the same words. Yes. Um, and so the the order of the words is less predictable if all you're learning is what should come next. Right, right. If you're, if you're learning the patterns of like uh, uh, agreement, um, so these other yes, levels yes. of information that yes. maybe, but yes. so I don't know how these, these yes. language models work in yes. that sense. But. Well, I think these link, I, I am not an expert um, <laughs> on these language models, but I do think these language models have bi-directional learning elder algorithms. So they can, they are learning about what comes before and what comes after. They have to very varying degrees depending on the model, they have almost like an attentional bias that can get set and that does seem to be helpful and maybe that would have to be different in different languages is the nature of the attentional bias. But yeah. So that's interesting. So one question I think coming back to what Charlie is getting at is how much you can use these models to really understand human language. Right. Um, I mean there's been decades of research in natural language processing uh, models trying to simulate how we learn right. and whether we need rules or we don't need rules right. and, and things like that. Right. And so I went, I'm not knowing what the algorithms are behind the scenes yes. on these. Like, yes. is it really a model of, of how we learn language to begin right. with? And, and is it, do we think of it as a representational model? Do we think of it as more of a process? I mean, it does. It seems more like a representational model, maybe, than a processing model, but... Would you say um, something about what those two things are? Well, I mean, a processing model really has to take into account the, the, the temporal dynamics and memory limitations and attentional limitations, and it's just really about... Um, Am I trying to simulate the mechanisms by which the brain actually can do these things, or am I just trying to get the right ordering of outputs? And it doesn't matter if it would take GPT longer for this word, but a human longer for that word, right? So kind of a granularity of, of timing and stuff. So, um, one, one thing that I had heard about with these, um, uh, just listening on the radio to these things, uh, is that 
in some sense, and this may be incorrect, that what GPT produces has to have, they, it had to have experienced it before. Oh. So the generative ability is not there, that I is part of the human language, right? That we can generate in infinite numbers, combinations, right. whereas GPT is more dependent on the experience of having ex actually seen the combinations of words before. Interesting. Yeah. And, and we can generate combinations of words we've never, never seen. seen how, before. how do we know that? How do we do that? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> you know, how, do, how do we depends, that It depends on if you're on the East Coast or on the West Coast. <laughs> No, but we. Yeah, no, too. but you, do you mean how do we know that that is true? That, yes, that's what I mean. I, I think. Oh, that we've generated things that we've never heard before. Yeah, I mean, you say you assert that we can generate sequences of words that make sentences that we've never heard, and I'm just wondering, what, how do you know that? Well, we know that from child language, yes, right? Yes, that's true. The, they do we? <laughs> I, I think I think probably I'm not sure we could be uh, sure of that, but I yeah I mean I think that that developmentally you certainly get to, uh, but but you know you could ask how do we know that never 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 They've never heard that before yeah I I think it's it's almost more anecdotal but it's a powerful anecdote like surely we've all heard someone say a sentence and you're like that is not a sentence I think I would ever have expected to hear in my life but we understand what the person meant right. So, yeah. So that would be a good test of a of a model. I think part of the fascination with these models is that they seem so realistic that we start to question. Yeah. Uh, does the model actually understand the meaning? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, which I don't really have a good way of knowing that, although I might just make an assumption about it. Uh, and it, but if it doesn't, how do I know that I do? Right, because <laughs> right. It does this about the same thing that I do. Yes. So it's a sort of Turing test kind of thing. Right. Where you start to attribute sentience to the language model, and people have done that. Even people in the in the industry have gone around saying my language model is conscious. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Get, usually it's responsive. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Doing Yes. that. laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, what does it mean to, to be conscious, right? Like, I mean, because even Siri is pretty good at responding yeah. to things that you ask, right? It gives it gives you the impression of yeah. having... So I was wondering if there's an experiment, like uh, uh, one of the experiments that you have done is uh, is to, to make a word more or less meaningful based on the accumulative knowledge of the entire sentence up to that point. And knowing that it's not just the next word, but it's some larger time scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an experiment you can do. You know how to do that. Well, and can we have, that, right? Uh, so we've taken GPT in particular, and we've asked it to um, basically predict what is coming up next. And then we have asked humans to comprehend those sentences and correlated the size of their brain response. And this is this N400 brain response that seems to be related to meaning processing. And GPT does an amazing job of predicting. Um, it does a really good job. Now, human human production norms are better than GPT for when you get to more predictable words. Um, so, you know, there's, you, you kind of, the probability scale is interesting because you can ask, you know, humans can, you can sort of get 80% of people will agree that this word and 60% and 20%, but then you get down to a point where no one's ever going to say a particular word in this sentence. GPT can still predict, you know, subtle differences because we can query it as many times as we want. Um, so in the very low end of the probability spectrum, we only have GPT, but it can predict the brain's, the human brain's responses very well. When we get to the higher end of the uh, predictability spectrum where we have both humans and model, the model does well, humans do better. So there's clearly things, you know, that humans are adding to this that, be, that predict human responses to it that GPT doesn't quite have, but it does a pretty good job. So at just the surface level of it can predict what's likely to come next, and humans can, of course, do that, and there's a pretty good um, correlation even when we get down to brain signals, not just, you know, overt predictions, but... That's remarkable. I mean, I mean, I was sort of expecting you to say, oh no, we've got an experiment we can do with humans, and when we try that experiment on the language model, it doesn't, it doesn't work. work no. No. But that's not the case. No, it does work. Yeah, it does work. So, so now, now you've got me puzzled because you keep saying prediction. And so what does prediction mean? if ChatGPT doesn't know the meaning of the sentences? Well, ChatGPT is clearly just predicting the word, right? 
Um, but, you know, there is an argument that you could just derive semantics from knowing word distributions, you know, in some sense. So that even if you never represented a feature like orange, say, if the word carrot and the word orange and other sorts of things that are orange all co-occur with this other thing that you sort of know somehow, right, that it's orange. You've never experienced orange as a color, but you have, you know, built up enough representations of things to sort of, in that sense, derive the meaning, whatever that means, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. There was another interesting phenomenon, speaking of, you know, not necessarily with the chat GPT, but just thinking about language databases and what's mm -hmm. produced that you said the other day was really interesting. So Kara gave the example of uh, that, you know, we typically think of carrots. If you ask someone to say, well, uh, what's, what color do you think of when you think of a carrot, they're going to say they're going to say orange. Um, so that's the most likely color associated with carrots. But it turns out that that's not the word that people produce in natural language because you assume that carrots are orange. You don't need to say that carrots are orange. And so you actually only say that carrots are purple or carrots are white because they're odd. that's an odd thing for it to be. And so if you look at the text data, the text data would lead you to think that purple would be a likely continuation. <laughs> right. Um, but, but even though if you ask a person what's the most likely color, they would say orange. So there's a disconnect between the, the, the conditions in which you ask someone to produce the language, whether it's natural or in the context of like what's right. the most, you know, free association versus yes. natural language. So that, that's also interesting because what GPT is using is that natural language. They're yes. not using semantic association norms from right. having asked somebody to free associate, right? So yeah. So this question of whether GPT has some embedded knowledge of pragmatics is really kind of interesting. So one of my graduate students, Emily Mack, actually did um, a study like this. So she gave people sentences like, the waiter explained to the patrons that the carrots today are, and you know, people now predict purple. They do not predict orange. That would be an odd thing for a waiter to tell you. And the human brain responses go along with um, what humans expect. They don't expect orange. And so you don't get orange, even though orange is highly associated with carrots out of, um, out of a context. Um, and so we don't know, I think, whether GPT has sort of also managed to statistically infer some pragmatics that waiters talk about carrots as purple and waiters don't talk about carrots <laughs> as orange or not. Um, so... Yeah. That would be closer to sentient, I think. <laughs> so, uh, and sort of another angle on it maybe would be mechanistic. Yes. So um, that's clearly different, right? right? That's clearly different. So so let's talk about that for a second because um, it seems to I don't know anything more than what you taught me. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the way I understand it is the idea is that the brain has these um, sort of networks that represent possible words that could come up and that many of these networks exist and many of them can be activated to some degree at any one time. And so the activation level of each one of them would tell you what the brain thinks mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. the probability that that word is next and that those are kind of separate and that they don't really interact with each other very much. It's a sort of a parallel mm -hmm, right. can generation of candidates. Right, right, right. And then at some point, there's a there must be another brain mechanism that sort of selects between those right, candidates. Right, right, right. How does it work with language models? Are they doing the, basically the same thing in some kind of a neural network? Or are they, are they using something more algorithmic than that? Because... I don't know. You have now reached the edge of my knowledge <laughs> of these language networks. So, I mean, they're, they, they definitely have analogies with the first part of that. They're deep networks. They have lots of layers, which really just means they have lots of possibility of learning very complex sets of interactions, right? Every time you add a, another layer to a neural network model, what you're really doing is giving it another, if you think of it in statistical terms, another set of possible modulations or interactions that it can make. So, you know, um, and so that it get, and it gets tons and tons of data, and so it's really good at learning even very complex, very deeply embedded statistical patterns. Um, but beyond that, it doesn't then seem to. Well, as far as I know, there aren't these more complex mechanisms of a, of attention or um, selection or other sorts of things, right? Um, but then. 
so that's that's how the the sort of that's how information is represented in these models. But when like um, when, when the model is actually generating the, the output that we're reading in the screen when we ask ChatGPT to do something, I, I don't know what the computation is being used to, you know. I think it's just filtering through to an output level and then that output level outputs something, but I don't know. I think really that know. output level outputting something is basically selection, right? I mean, there's that part. All of those well, except different... that it's a whole layer, right? So like any neural network, you have to, somebody, something has to translate from, uh, uh, you know, a, just a set of activation states across a large network into what I'm going to put on the screen, right? So, so there is, there is a translation stage there. Like, do you pick the most active one? Is that how, you, you know, that's one way of doing it. So then. How but, do we do it? Well, right, but we, so we, we, we do it, I don't know how we do it, <laughs> but I mean, we're trying to find out how we do it. Um, but right, it seems like the brain has to make some decisions, it has to put some decisions over its large um, um, activation array. And similarly, somebody has to do that for, um, for these large language models. So, so I think you're getting at a, um, a key debate in the field, Charlie, because there are different models of, of how we decide on a word. So whether it's a production model or a comprehension model, um, comprehension models, just if you're thinking of the simplest level of word, word recognition, um, if you get a series of letters, D, O, you know, you can start thinking about what words those could be. And so as those letters come into your system, they're going to sort of, uh, you know, act, um, Activation for some of the nodes, nodes of D and O are going to be high. And so doll and dog and door are, are may, all of those options may still be available in, in that network based on the nodes that are active. And as the information comes in, you start to narrow down because when you get G, then it can't be doll anymore and so on and so forth. Right? So there's one idea is that you have this this sort of spread of the activation through the system, and you can have multiple words active without having a selection process. So what ends up happening, that's kind of the winner-take-all model of, you know, when you get to the end, you know, you have all of the pieces of information, and there's one winner that has the most activation. And so this, the it's not... Uh, different models will state whether you you actually need a, something to go in and pick, like you were saying. Like one, you get you have your options, and something has to happen to select the item, versus having it be part of the system itself that sort of surfaces the best candidate. Don't we still pick because if, if there are several words that mean something different, but they're all spelled the same, mm -hmm. at some point we decide. Which are the meanings? So there's Jeez. one thing, which is picking the word, mm -hmm. recognizing the word, which is the kind of thing we think the machine can do. And then there's the knowing which meaning of that word mm -hmm. is appropriate, which mm -hmm. is maybe something we think the machine can't do, or at least yeah. we think we can. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. that actually is a good question. Like if you just think of dictionary, like feeding dictionary information to a model, and you have multiple meanings. How does it know which meaning to use in different contexts? That's mm -hmm. a, especially if it's not you know not verb noun. You can get class word class from the sentence from the structure, but yeah, knowing which it might not. I mean, sometimes like Chat GPT will sometimes say, "Well, I don't know what you mean by that." Right. You know, there are four possible things you might have meant. Right. Here's my right. answer. To each <laughs> yes. One of them. Right. Right. And. Uh, we don't. We sometimes say that. Well, you know, you. <laughs> right. Well, and one of the things is though that you know, what, when we're thinking about selecting, we're kind of moving again into production land. We're we're we're, we're imagining in some sense that either because we're selecting in the state of which we're going to be consciously aware of, or we're selecting because we're going to say it out loud. But when you actually go in and measure with EEG, it's clear that in a lot of cases, people don't select. You might activate both meanings of the verb meaning of duck and the noun meaning of duck, and you might do nothing else. You activate them and you move on. And that may be sufficient because as long as one of the right meanings got active, you understood. And the fact that the other one was active, you don't actually have to deal with it. But if you're going to produce it, you have to deal with it. And so that's kind of an interesting dissociation, right? That you can, that for comprehension, there's a, there's a lot of cleaning up that maybe you really don't have to do. 
And I think that's hard to see because we're often measuring comprehension through some kind of output. And by definition, when you go through the output, it forces the cleanup process. And so do we use the same brain networks for comprehension and for production? Or are there uh, right. different It's ones? another debate. Okay. It's a, another big, it's another big debate. Um, and I mean, I fall on the side of thinking that there is um, a, a good deal of overlap um, at the, particularly in the areas I'm interested in, like meaning. I think that, you know, the meaning representations you use to comprehend are probably also the meaning representations you use to produce. But production has all of these other demands. You have to select, you have to sequence, you have to, to do other stuff that you don't necessarily have to do when you're comprehending. Well, I, uh, I'm still unconvinced that we really need to know the meanings of things. <laughs> yeah, that's right, to understand <laughs> each other. <laughs> they are, you know, there's, there are people actually uh, doing something along those lines who are creating artificial grammars, and they, they focus on the grammar, but we could totally get, maybe do a collaboration and, and just have them talk to each other in a language without meaning and see if they can produce correct sentences. <laughs> and as, if that's what you mean, like yeah. just being able to produce the output without really knowing what you're saying. I suppose you could learn to do that, mm -hmm. learn to sequence the words correctly. And, For sure, yeah. But, it, but you need the meaning because the meaning is the message and that's the point of it, right? So that's the question is, does GPT really understand the message right. even if they're uh -huh. producing this correct sequence of words? If you got two of them talking to each other. Yeah. They, so it might seem as though they understand exactly, each other, but we would assume that they don't. That they don't know. And so the way to do that would be if you can get the gist of what they said. So if you send, if you get GPT to output a sentence and then you get the other GPT to paraphrase what they said, that would be the test. I'm sure they, that would work. <laughs> right? GPT At least they would That's try. true. That would still be statistical properties of what the meaning is. Yeah. What the meaning is. Right, hmm. right. How right. do we get a meaning? This is a Well, I mean, I guess it comes down to what we mean by a meaning. For, I think, yeah. I think, right? I think that what humans can do that is important to us is that it's not just language to language. You know, if Tony tells me, hey, can you hand me the coffee cup? Um, I cannot just say, yes. I really reach out and hand him an object and if he and if I hand him glasses instead that is not appropriate right yeah, and the model absolutely <laughs> uh, right so so if you so right so if you begin to pair a large language model with then um, a model that maps between language and other sorts of outputs then you begin to build a system that seems more human brain like right and so then you, you can start asking these questions but a language model right now is really just running language statistics it does not know what a table is in the sense that it can't you know it can't recognize one from any other modality oh that'll be so easy and did i just have to feed them a bunch of pictures absolutely. Of tables and <laughs> absolutely there's some questions somebody is going to do I, I, Maybe people are already working yeah. hard work well i mean that. i yes but, i mean there are definitely um, companies out there for example that are you know that you can give and you can play with some of these as well in image generation sorts of software, right? Where you give it a verbal input and you say, I would like a picture of a guy drinking coffee next to a pink lake on Mars. And it will generate a picture like that, right? So that now we have sort of some kind of image to language related thing. So, so what's the boundary that convinces you that we are not just computers? So that's what actually, actually, that's what I'm... But we are I'm thinking kind of this is an opportunity, matrix, right? I mean, it's an opportunity for us to deal with yeah. this issue. Right. It's a little bit like that problem of qualia or something yes, like exactly. that. Yes, exactly. Which neuroscientists usually say, "Oh, don't bother me with these right. philosophical <laughs> things. Right. I can't right. possibly <laughs> answer them." But if if there was an experimental opportunity to try to answer stuff like that, of course we would want right. to do that. Of course right. we would. Yeah. Right. Right. And uh, this seems like it's moving in the direction right. of being right. able to answer that kind of question. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So cool. That was really, really fun. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks. And Nicole and Antonio. <laughs> and this has been Neuroscientist Talk Shop. <laughs>